what he's asked me to do is to give you an overview of the first 18 months of this project, um, and we must gratefully acknowledge um, our funders, Comic Relief, a uh, UK-based um, funder, um, and I bring greetings also from my organization, uh, the South African Institute for Distance Education, which, which has a great interest in open education resources, uh, an office based in Johannesburg, but also uh, in Nairobi, Kenya. And I think that um, Sam and Elizabeth have, have introduced you really to the, um, to the point of this project, and so has Bonnie. So without further ado, I'd like to actually move on to talk about, um, well, first of all, our gratitude um, to the University of, of British Columbia for the enormous um, uh, involvement um, of people uh, that we have been able to draw on uh, in order to make this uh, project viable, and we believe um, as a success, body herself, um, Dr. Julia Tempe, who's a PhD graduate of UBC, um, Sam and Demma, um, who needs no introduction to you, his wife Doris Averia, who's one of our pilot site co uh, coordinators, and as we speak at this moment, Espen Stranger Johannesson, a graduate student of UBC, um, is in fact um, showing um, and dealing with the African storybook in um, Arugua. And um, Bonnie will show you the picture of him, um, of, a, of a teacher using or projecting one of these stories in a classroom in, in Uganda. So that's really highly exciting. Um, what made the African Storybook Project? And I think um, I want I want to say one very important thing, um, and that is that I think that many uh, projects that are technology oriented find it easier to work with uh, if they're working with um, uh, populations that are. Um, in developing countries, they tend to hone in on those um, elements of the population that actually will take to the technology relatively easily. But I think our problem in Africa um, is that there is in fact this tremendous inequality. And in South Africa, we are painfully conscious of this. And I think it is demonstrated very clearly in um, graphs that have been developed um, that demonstrate um, the patterns of literacy achievement um, in South Africa. And Bonnie, if you could just show that bimodal um, distribution of, of achievement. Very often we think of African children as almost perhaps homogenous, but this kind of graph shows us that that is not the case that there is in fact a bimodal distribution of achievement and that it is an issue of class. The wealthiest 20 to 25 percent achieve results that are slightly over or comparable to international norms, but the vast majority, what I like to call the marginalized majority, the 75 to 80 percent, are really lagging behind. And when we think about solutions, particularly technology-based and literacy solutions, we have to actually think about the marginalized majority and not confuse them with the privileged 20% um, or 25% in these countries. I think that the next slide also shows um, how language is also crucial in the class um, differentiation between different parts of the population. And here in South Africa, we have um, uh, a differentiated score according to the, the language of the schools. Formerly whites only schools, English and Afrikaans, um, are on the right there, and formerly um, the disadvantaged. Um, Black schools, blacks are only schools are on the left. Now what's happened in the new South Africa is that the schools on the right have become integrated racially, but the patterns of achievement haven't changed. 
So African language um, and the way that African languages are taught um, doesn't actually contribute to the improvement of literacy in South Africa. And although in South Africa the inequalities are perhaps the starkest, I think these inequalities are played out um, in other African countries as well. And so, um, the African Storybook Project, and we have to keep on telling ourselves this, has to address the marginalized majority. If we go to contribute to literacy development in Africa, we in fact need to have a little bit of affirmative action. We need to really concentrate on the 80% and not the top 20 to 25% on the understanding that those are representatives of African children generally. And the next, the next slide. So as we move through each aspect of this project, we have to say, we have to remember the 80% as we work with and in local African languages. As we focus ourselves, we've got to say that why are we working in African languages? It's as a basis for sound literacy development leading to a better foundation for the acquisition of the language and wider communication. We can easily be distracted by saying we want to preserve African languages. We want to preserve um, cultures. We want to <laughs> avoid the extinction of various endangered languages. Or in South Africa, we want to promote the learning of African languages for the purposes of social cohesion. These are very important, but they're not the main point. The main point is we've got to look at African languages as a means whereby the marginalized majority can get a sounder base uh, for, their, for their literacy um, development. I think a second aspect that is also important is that very often we think that standardized versions of African languages um, are, are the way to go um, if we want to teach literacy to African children. But we know from our experience on the ground, and I'm sure you know too, um, that often the standardized dialect is an alien to children as a language that is not local. And so we have to be very careful as we work with a, uh, um, African languages that we don't simply privilege the privileged standardized African language versions or dialects. That we must open ourselves to using the language that the children find familiar and not strange. And if we move on to the next point, obviously we have to remember the 80% as we work with digital tools and med delivery because it's already mentioned, technology is very easily assimilated by the top 20%. And there's another danger, I think. We also need to avoid greenhouse technology experiments for small samples of the 80%. I think our challenge is, and we are trying to work towards this as we work with the African Storybook Project, the challenge is systemic implementation for the majority. And then, of course, we have to remember the 80% as we decide on publishing models. It's the 20% who buy books, but we need to encourage reading for the 80% who can't buy a book. And so if we use open licensing, and place versioning and storytelling in the hands of the 80%, we may be able to facilitate access to the quantity of material in the variety of languages needed to include these 80% in the reading market. The publishers might well thank us in decades to come. And finally, we have to remember the 80% as we work with partners. We are painfully aware, um, and as I'm sure you are as well, that literacy development doesn't come naturally as a result of changes in policy, in curriculum, or even the provision of resources where there were none before. It requires learning how to use the new resources and the local language to stimulate literacy development. And I think this is one of the most important reasons that we need partners. We need partners who are working with people in the target group that can take and use the resources and help people to 
to, to maximize those and to ensure that it's actually reading that is done um, and improvement in reading and writing through these digital resources. And so, um, the digital platform for access and use of stories for early reading, our target, not the children themselves, also for the reasons that we've expressed, um, the 80% of children in, on the continent are not going to have ready access to the technology. Our target audience for the platform is the people and the literacy development organizations who work with the children and the teachers, not the children themselves. I just want to say that we have built this platform in Drupal um, and open source um, and the open source code that we have developed will be made available by the end of 2014 um, so that other people who wish to use our modules um, to build other such similar um, platforms will have those um, available to them. We are, con we are developing this website um, in response to feedback from the pilot sites and particularly from our staff and others who are working in the pilot countries. So the website, although the basic functionality is already there, um, the search, um, the version and the create, and the create of course is the foundation for the whole uh, website, um, various kinds of features are being added as we proceed. And in terms of the first um, six months where the um, website has been built sufficiently for people to use it, um, we have had two main pieces of feedback, lots of small pieces of feedback, but the two main pieces of feedback are about slowness. Um, and we are really struggling, I think, in Uganda. And I'm sure Sam and Elizabeth are nodding their heads <laughs> as, as I speak, because the bandwidth is really very poor in, in Uganda, even at very major events like international conferences. So we have to be even more vigilant um, about um, low bandwidth situations. Secondly, one of the major criticisms that we've had is that at the moment, the system doesn't allow users to upload their own illustrations. And of course, um, we, you know, as we create a story, we would like to create the illustrations for the story. The functionality at the moment allows people to create a story um, and then pull images from our image bank, which has hundreds and actually thousands of images in it but might not have the range that people require when they want to express themselves through a story. So our response for the next release of the website um, in October, so I look forward to that, okay. is um, that we want to work and work on a Mobi site which will maximize the reading experience for low bandwidth situations. With the ability to download in EPUB, not only in PDF as currently and a much bigger range of print options um, for, for um, different kinds of printing in situations where you don't want a digital um, projection of the story. But another um, thing that we will do is to offer a stripped down story creation tool. At the moment, when you create a story <clears throat> and you try to upload a illustration in a low bandwidth situation, it, it, it bombs out. So we are going to take that out and allow people the opportunity um, to, to write an illustration brief and then ask us to put in the illustrations into their story, which would of course uh, enable other people elsewhere also to submit illustrations. But illustrations are sensitive, as we'll see later on in our presentation. So. We don't want people just to upload it without our having had a look at those illustrations because um, a lot of quite scary things, I think, might be able to happen, might happen. So, um, I mean, the next thing that I need to um, give you an overview of um, is of the stories that we've already got on the website. Um, and to make the point 
that our overall goal with this project is a sustainable way to provide stories good enough to be used for literacy development. And I, there are two things here. The one is the sustainable way. In other words, the community's got to contribute here. But on the other hand, they also have to be good, at, good enough to be used for literacy development. Often I think, coming from a distance education background, that the materials that are produced are simply not good enough for people to learn from. Um, I think that there's a, there's, a, there's a threshold level and we need to ensure that the materials are, are good enough so that actual literacy development can take place through them. And so, as we built up to um, uh, launching the website, we wanted to start with a critical mass of stories for, for children to use in the pilot sites. We needed 120, we thought. We needed the 120 translated into the languages of the pilot sites. We wanted to test the sources that we could find for stories to put onto this website. And we also wanted to test the amount of work involved in digital publishing. We wanted to work out what it takes to supply sufficient exemplars of stories, picture stories, stories that children can read on their own, for the 80%. And one of the things that, that really dawned on us as we proceeded with this project is that that 80%, many of the teachers, many of the uh, children, are not actually familiar with the genre of picture stories. So you can't expect people to contribute to a digital platform when, in fact, the genre um, is not something with which you are familiar. So the notion of exemplars becomes very important in, in that kind of context. So let's have a look at some of the sources of our first stories, if Bonnie would put up that slide there. And you can see um, that most of the stories came from our partners, which I think is really encouraging. We got quite a number of stories from our pilot sites for our pilot countries, South Africa, Uganda, and Kenya. But a lot of those stories were, didn't come illustrated and needed quite a lot of work to make them publishable. So therefore, the stories, not all of those stories, reached the website in the, amongst the first 120 batch. We also looked on the internet. We found um, openly licensed stories on the internet. And we worked with a, one famous author and asked him for three of his stories, Alexander McCall Smith, with whom I'm sure many of you um, with, uh, are familiar. Um, he was very gracious and very excited that we were wanting to version and re-illustrate his stories. So going forward, um, we want to maintain the contribution from partners. And this is, I think, where the people sitting in this audience can actually help if you know of stories that would be very suitable for this 80% African children's audience. That would be great if you could send it to us. We would like to increase the donation from famous authors. We would like to identify how to print appropriate stories in local languages and republish them so that we can in fact digitally preserve many of the high quality conventionally published stories which are now out of print and people can't find them anymore. So if you can help us with that, it would be really good. We also, and the next slide shows this, um, most of our stories were in fact donated. Um, very, some were developed centrally by ourselves in Johannesburg or in Kenya. Um, and some of them were developed um, through workshops. They were products of workshops. And what we would like to do going forward is to reduce the need to centrally develop stories, to maintain the donations, and to get many more local language stories from story development workshops. And here I need to report on a, a really exciting um, project that we're engaging with, with the Montino Institute for Language and Literacy in Johannesburg, where we are working with them to develop and using their method to develop supplementary readers 
for South African languages, but also for the Swahili and Luya in Kenya, um, and then also later uh, next year in a couple of the languages in Uganda. So that kind of process where we, we work on decodable text, but nevertheless stories, because decoding is not where it's not the beginning and the end. I mean, the children must be able to read it. They must be able to read it on their own. But decodable text doesn't create an enjoyment um, of, of reading necessarily amongst that target audience. <coughs> Next we move um, to the question of language and translation. And as you will see from the next slide, um, the original language in which the first 120 stories um, was, were received was almost entirely English. Um, and that just serves to underline the scarcity of existing material in local African languages. And so, of course, we needed to commission illustrations. And as it as of, as of mid-June this year, uh, the next slide shows us uh, the numbers of stories and the numbers of languages into which we have translated those stories. So the numbers of stories that exist on the website in the various languages focusing on the languages of the pilot sites. Uh, we have a number of concerns about translation. Um, and I've already mentioned one of them, so I won't go into that, and that is the issue of uh, alienating standard versions of the language. But what I'd like to say is that on the one hand, one worries about quality. And there is certainly a need for some language moderation, um, particularly of languages that are not familiar to our in-country coordinators. But on the one hand, there's that. But on the other hand, we really want to empower the people who are using these stories to do curation. And a really encouraging um, story from our pilot sites in Attridge or Pretoria are that um, they take the stories that are written in Sanhedrin and they adjust them to the kind of language that they regard as important for them to teach in their particular school. So there needs to be, as Judith commented yesterday in one of our meeting, there needs to be a re-education of our users. If you don't like it, change it. That's the miracle of the digital platform that we are engaged in. Now, the, the next point that I think is tremendously important um, is that of um, how much work is involved in republishing digitally. Now, there's a certain amount of work that is to be expected. Um, reformatting, engaging authors and illustrators um, and organizations on open licenses and copyright issues. But where we need to find sustainable ways of continuing this project are in getting the stories illustrated and in reshaping the stories. Um, the next slide shows you the two licenses that we've uh, decided to go for. Many people who donate stories want a non-commercial license, um, but our default license is uh, a simple CC BY, Creative Commons Attribution License. But how much work then was involved in republishing or publishing the first 120 stories? Pi diagrams in the next slide show you that we're almost hitting the 50% level. Um, the blue indicates little work, and the red indicates the amount of work that we had to do to reshape um, the stories, um, to edit them and, re and, and, and improve them so that they really, the, the inherent quality of those stories emerged. And the second, the other pie diagram shows the number of stories proportion of stories that came already illustrated and the proportion 
where we needed to commission illustrations, which of course, as you know, is an expensive business. What we'd like to do is, and our next slide shows our strategy to use sustainability. We can't carry on commissioning a lot of illustrations. So what we've done is created an image bank for user reuse of commissioned illustrations or part illustrations in story creation. And there you see some of the elements um, in one of the Ananzi stories, um, with the spider and the tree and the, the, the sky god and the clouds, etc. And the other thing that we want to do is to empower more and more our users to create their own methods of digital illustration. And you see a cute little monkey at the bottom of that slide, um, which children um, in grade six in South Africa, um, <clears throat> they used paint in Microsoft Word and they created their own illustrations. Absolutely delightful. Um, and we also thought that any kind of reshaping that we engage in should actually be an educational exercise, um, not only a publishing one where we are actually engaging with the target audience in understanding stories and writing of stories and how to make oral stories into books uh, more effectively. <coughs> Bonnie, how's it going? Actually, yeah, absolutely are, amazing, Tessa. It's uh, do people need to pause for questions or should I proceed until the end? I, I think it's probably okay to proceed, Tessa, and then we were, we, we were at now 10 o'clock uh, we've still got half an hour, so assuming we would want some time for questions, we've got at least another, say, 10, 15 minutes for presentation, and then that will still give us 15 minutes for questions. Is that okay? Thank okay. Super. Okay, thank you. Now, this issue, I mean, one of the most fascinating things about this project is working with local oral stories to convert them into picture stories on a global platform. And in that, there's a lot to that. Um, one of the issues is the challenge and the time involved in getting authentic illustrations for stories that come from the ground. One of our most fascinating engagements has been with the Ugandan Community Libraries Association. Um, this association consists of 109 libraries in very poor circumstances all across Uganda. Um, and we um, are aware of them um, as one of our pilot sites, um, or in fact, two or three of our pilot sites are associated with the Uganda Community Libraries Association. But we um, worked with um, a person who, who works in the Ginger Cluster in eastern Uganda. To, and he ran a series of workshops to generate stories, particularly at levels one and two, the lower levels, um, from these um, community library people who are not teachers or university people. They're ordinary people um, who happen to have an interest in stories and, and literacy and their own language. Um, and he was the most amazing stories. And the next slide shows you a couple, um, a story in Lusoga called The Egg, or What Goes Around Comes Around. Um, and it's, it's absolutely fascinating. The story is about an egg um, given to a grandson by the grandmother because she loves him very much giving it to him and she says to him, this will be your bride price when you are of age. And she sets him on his journey. And then of course a series of things happen to him. And um, he, he meets some blackberry gatherers, they ask him for an egg, but when they take the egg, they use it to beat the berries and it breaks. And then of course he says to them, well, um, you've, you've broken my egg, you've got to give me something in return. So they give him a stick and he goes on. And then something happens to the stick and then he goes on, the story goes on, and eventually he comes to a wedding. And um, they, 
they, <coughs> they take the cow that he's eventually got as a replacement um, for the egg through these various adventures. They slaughter the cow and they eat it at the wedding feast. And then he says to them, but what are you going to give me in return? Um, you've taken my cow now. And they say, we've got nothing except the bride. <laughs> <laughs> so they they give him the bride. And he, so the egg has in fact served as the bride price. <laughs> but the fascinating thing was when we engaged with Cornelius Lugere um, around the illustrations, we didn't really understand the egg and the real significance of that egg. And he said to us, look at, uh, note the symbolism of the egg, the source of life, and the earth being shaped like an egg. Make, when you draw the berries, make them small, they're small, oval-shaped fruits, just like the egg. When you talk about the berries being beaten, and, you know, they use the egg to beat the berries and to get them down. It isn't really beating, it's shooting, but it's not shooting with an arrow, it's shooting with a sling. Now, <laughs> you can see how things are unfolding as we talk to people about the illustrations. And we understand the story so much better now, um, and hopefully we can... We can, we can get it illustrated um, in the way that it really ought to be illustrated. Um, we want to build up a, a, a kind of bank of illustrations um, or, or, or pictures that we can use to inform illustrations that will be authentic in those particular countries. But it's a real challenge and really that's a study on its own. We'd love somebody to undertake a study like that. The other issue, of course, is when we get stories, um, and particularly when they're illustrated, where th there might be some consternation um, and uh, an opinion that they might, they might not be acceptable, particularly for children. And the next slide shows a really interesting story called The Girl with One Breast. Um, which is, as you see from the illustrations, quite a violent story where the husband, um, happily married to his wife, goes into a forest one day and sees the most beautiful woman that he's ever seen in his life before, falls in love with her, and she says to him, I'm sorry, before you marry me, you must know that I've only got one breast. So the man thinks about what to do, and he goes back to his wife, as you see, and he takes a knife and he cuts off her breast. And then he takes the breast back into the forest to give to this beautiful woman. And he wanders around the forest looking for the beautiful woman, looking for her, looking for her some more. He can't find her, and then it dawns on him. She has bewitched him. And he is devastated and races back to find his wife, only to see her bleeding to death. She dies, and he is so mortified that he hangs himself. Now that's quite a story. Um, it's a story from Uganda. It's a story that is regarded as sending a very strong moral message. And but when you illustrate it, you, uh, particularly graphically, um, and people just go onto your website and they see this, they might get the wrong idea. So although we believe that censorship is antithetical to openness, and if you make a, um, a platform like this open to everybody, you shouldn't, you can't, in fact, you can't censor. But we are attempting to, and I'm phrasing this particularly carefully, we are attempting to manage acceptability through managing the illustrations. And hence, not actually letting people, without our having a look at it, letting people upload their own illustrations. And maybe that's a point of debate 
and I'd love people to tackle us on this and give us another view, but that's where we've arrived at in the first 18 months. And so with this particular story, we didn't censor it, we didn't exclude it from the collection. Um, we raised the level, we made it for older kids, and we asked um, another local illustrator um, to illustrate it uh, in ways, in, in more, in less graphic kind of ways. And let's see what happens. Let's see who reads it and how they respond to it. Really could be interesting um, to see what emerges. So these are some of the wonderful challenges um, that, that we are having as we develop and um, find stories on the ground. But of course there's also the delivery of stories. And we have certain guiding principles here. Um, we, we need to think about methods of delivery of the stories that consider the resources that the majority of African children currently get to help them to learn to read, and aim to exceed this in quantity, quality, and variety through the use of technology, but without massive investment in infrastructure devices. So it can't be a comprehensive technology solution that we're looking at here. It's an enabling. We're exploring what will enable um, these stories to be de delivered. We have to provide and test low-cost models of delivery of the stories, based not on the assumption that the technology is currently available, but on affordability for large-scale provision. So what we're thinking about is, with our pilot sites, giving them and testing certain types of um, technological models of delivery, and then seeing how much they cost, and then costing it out, and then proposing um, that uh, large organizations or projects or governments um, might be able to facilitate access to um, the digital forms of these stories in an affordable kind of way, and we would be able to give them um, uh, uh, figures and uh, budgets for this. So that's our aim um, in, the, in the four years of the project. And the options for delivery that we are looking at, on-demand printing through the use of local copying and printing centers, part-time website access where stories are downloaded and saved on local devices for sharing. So in other words, we're not expecting people to be connected in order to read. That's very, very important. Um, the use of low-cost hardware devices, and I think Shadan is going to demonstrate one such device, um, which we think is really <coughs> exciting, um, this afternoon, and I'm really sorry to be missing that, um, where you can put on this tiny machine such a lot of such a quantity of data and use it um, as a hotspot um, for a number of different devices. Um, working in collaboration with partners who may already be engaged in technology and literacy and building on those those initiatives and such an initiative would be perhaps the world of readers schools <clears throat> but at the moment our major focus is on uh, the, the fifth option um, which is demonstrated there um, in on the slide where a tablet and a laptop plus a handheld projector um, can can project the stories on in a classroom that is darkened, um, and you see there uh, a classroom in Munanga with a portable chalkboard covered in in um, newsprint, uh, and the, the 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 story I enjoy is projected quite easily there. Um, but and of course. We are working all the time with the electricity and internet challenges, portable solar charges, um, because we came across some really shocking statistics. I mean, whereas South Africa is 84% of the population is on grid electricity, um, in Uganda it's 6%. In, in um, Kenya it's 23%, but when you go into rural Kenya, it, it drops right down. Um, to 
So we expected many more people to have electricity than that is the case. Um, and so we're having to look at the solar options really quite, um, quite seriously. And they have a lot of challenges <coughs> because we want them to be portable. Um, because solar panels um, installed on roofs are a security risk. They highly desirable, and unless you put a security guard there, um, they get stolen. So we're looking at portable solar charges, but often these um, don't work powerfully enough um, for the range of devices that we want to project. So there's a lot of lessons of experience that have come out from this. Um, the, the photographs there show that the equipment we're wanting to do you know, can be put in a hard, uh, a hard shell suitcase um, and consists of things like um, the audio recorders, laptops, um, the portable digital projector um, and uh, the solar charger um, as well as modems and we've learnt that in fact you can't provide a modem from one service provider, you have to provide one from each of the service providers so that when the internet connectivity is low from one service provider, you um, hope, hope to goodness that it will be better um, with another service provider. So each pilot site needs to have two modems. So these are the kinds of things that we're learning as we and then, of course, um, as I mentioned um, in the beginning of this uh, of this talk, uh, you can have equipment, you can have stories, but unless people are using them and using them for literacy development, um, then it's pointless. So we're working in three at three different levels first level with our pilot science, where our primary aim is to test conditions on the ground for the refinement of our strategy. The second level um, is in the pilot countries as, as a whole, uh, where we've conducted uh, quite a comprehensive mapping of early literacy initiatives and um, policies and um, state interventions um, in the pilot countries and where we are already concentrating on what it will take to implement the, the project systemically in a particular country. So for example, in Uganda, we are signing an MOU with the RTI Shaft project, which is a major national project in developing uh, readers, a reading scheme and teacher training um, in 12 of the Ugandan languages. We want to work with them um, so that our readers, our stories, can be supplementary readers in those languages. And then our readers go throughout the whole country. So ASP can, can then, through RTI, be systemically um, implemented in Uganda. We hope that that will work. I mean, that's one of the strategies. The other strategy in the pilot countries would be to obviously work with teacher training institutions where you're looking at teacher trainees who go out with the knowledge and the expertise into a range of different schools in different areas and districts. But then outside our pilot countries, our primary aim there is of course long-term sustainability. It's, it's the Wikipedia notion where all organizations and individuals use and contribute to the website and the stories, largely independently of us. And um, our next slide shows one of our most exciting partnerships, and there you see uh, Purvi Shah and Suzanne Singh from Pradhan Box in India, who came to the launch of our website in Pretoria earlier this month. Um, and really exciting to, to, to meet them. In 10 years, Pratham Books um, has produced 270 original titles in 12 Indian languages, uh, a total of 1,700 books. But what they've also done is release their stories under a Creative Commons attribution license on the platform Scribd. And that's where we found them. 
And in fact, we've taken 13 of their stories, which though they were generated in India, we think are highly applicable to African context. And we have translated them into a range of different African languages, and they are absolutely thrilled. But we're even more thrilled <laughs> about the fact that they are now building a platform, just like ours, um, for the Indian subcontinent. They're committed to open education resources. They want people to be able to version and create their own stories because they see that to, 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 to meet the need of resources in the over a thousand languages in India, and I believe there are 300 million children in India, which makes Africa look small by comparison. Um, 300 million children and over a thousand languages can't rely on one publishing company, however well disposed. Um, so they will be working with us. We will share with them our open source code. Um, we will, they might develop modules that we could use, and they would use our modules as a starting point for their particular platform. So it's a really nice win-win situation. And I believe uh, Bonnie tells me that there's quite a lot of interest in Canada about working in India. So maybe that's uh, something that we could discuss in the, in the question time. And so our, the trajectory of this project is that, I mean, we create and sustain an African community for sharing, um, starting with intensive work in the pilot sites. Um, we're encouraging partners from other countries and projects to use the website, creating and translating and adapting to suit their needs, until eventually we become a community for sharing and using local language stories for early reading, but with a strong um, African focus. That's what we're aiming to do. Um, and it might take us a lot more than four years to do this, we're hoping that we'll be able to generate further funds at the end of this grant to, to be able to continue our work. And so we come to the end, and up there I've, I've put uh, a, a list of the things that we thought of, um, which maybe can stimulate some discussion about how can you contribute. Um, and I think that list speaks for itself, but maybe people would like to engage with it, or to ask various questions, or to continue our discussion in some kind of way. And what we really want you to do is to spread the word. Thank you. Thank you.